Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe. <clears throat> I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Joe. Oh, I'm very nervous for some reason. I've given quite a few leads, and this one has definitely got me more nervous than most. But, uh, yeah, my home group is uh, the Stay and Sober group. It's a men's group. It meets Thursdays at 6.30 in West Seneca. Uh, my sobriety date is June 1st, 2015. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very honored to be speaking here. I was uh, in early sobriety. I was in a book study with a lot of the guys from this group, and uh, really molded and changed my sobriety. You know, they have, uh, you know, you guys have very strong message and it's, uh, it's just, I'm very honored to be here. So, uh, but before coming here, my wife yelled at me three times walking out the door because <clears throat> my first outfit didn't match. I was wearing plaid on plaid and she, <laughs> she refused to let me wear it. Then I, uh, she's like, what else do you got? I put this on and she's like, it's gray on gray. Are you crazy? <laughs> so I just said, I don't care, you know, and I walked out the door, but if this had been early sobriety, that's all I would have cared about, you know, is what people were thinking about me and how I looked. But, you know, it's it's not really like that anymore. I don't live that way. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I, um, I was born in uh, South Buffalo. I grew up in West Seneca. I have four sisters and two brothers. But I was uh, I was much younger than everyone else. I was 12 years younger. <clears throat> the doctors told my mom she couldn't have kids anymore, and uh, she had a happy little accident with me. So uh, they weren't really expecting it, but, you know, it's what God's will was. So um, I'm, I'm a lot younger. Most of my brothers and sisters has moved out of the house before I was even born. So I grew up with a couple of them. I had a, a very normal childhood. You know, my, my parents were together. They uh, they raised me well. They... Um, they, you know, taught me manners, all those things, and, uh, but it was very normal for uh, us to spend Saturdays and Sundays in a bar. My, uh, my parents were in a travel club with, like, 50 other friends from South Buffalo, and every Sunday they would have a meeting, and I would just get to get, like, you know, $10 worth of quarters and play all the games and see everybody laughing and having a good time, and I just... I just wanted that, you know, it's, uh, it was so attractive to me. I, I couldn't wait till I could start drinking because it just looked like so much fun from such a young age. And, uh, so in school, I, I did pretty good until, uh, you know, high school came and I started drinking and then I just, you know, stopped caring, stopped going to class. Uh, I was, um, I was a wrestler and <clears throat> I was, I was, I was pretty good. I had a lot of colleges recruiting me to go, and, uh, you know, they, they said all you got to do is get this certain score on your uh, on your test and, you know, take some physical. So I, uh, I, took, the, I took the test. I don't remember which, which one it was, but, uh, you know, I got the score they asked, and <clears throat> they told me that I, on a Saturday I had to go take some physicals and uh, – pass them. And then, you know, I would be able to go to college for wrestling. But I, uh, I honestly couldn't fit it in my schedule of drinking and partying. I couldn't, I didn't want to get up that early. I honestly believed in my head that if they wanted me to wrestle there bad enough, you know, they would figure it out. <laughs> I, I really believe that. So, you know, so I just did whatever I wanted and what I wanted to do was drink all the time. So I did that and uh, I didn't go to college. So, um, you know, I, I just couldn't believe it didn't work out because I was being so heavily recruited, you know, it's but, you know, <laughs> so me and a few of my buddies, you know, we'd already graduated high school and, uh, we're not really working. We're just sitting around and, you know, just figuring out how to get some money to get some beer every single day. And one of my friends said to me, he said, why don't we go into the military together? We can go in on a buddy program, you know, we'll be together through basic training, our first duty station, and then, you know, our first couple of years, they'll keep us together. And I'm, 
you know, why not? I'm not doing anything else. So we went to the recruiter. We signed up. The recruiter said, uh, just don't do drugs the day before the, the piss test. And he actually gave us stuff to pass our test. He just said, don't do anything the day before. So, you know, I listened to him. I didn't do anything the day before, but my friend did. So here I am. I already signed up with my friend to go in the Army. It was his idea, and he failed his drug test, so I had to go by myself. And I was pretty resentful about that, but, um, you know, it was great. I, uh, I went to the Army, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good soldier, but, you know, I found a bunch of people that were just like me who wanted to drink every single day, you know, and that's what I did. I drank every day. And I, uh, I got up and ran in the morning. I did whatever they asked me to. But as soon as I was done, I was getting drunk. And, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy how no matter where you are in life, you will always find the people who are going to do what, you know, you do. You just, you just find each other. So um, I, uh, I went, we went to Afghanistan and... Um, I was on this base with one other American and the coalition, which is just all the other soldiers from the other countries. And it was just me and this other American. And we're not allowed to drink while we're there. You know, it's, it's very against the rules. You are not allowed to drink during wartime. But this base we were on had three different bars on it from the Italians had their own bar. The Turkish had their own bar and they loved us. So like we were there drinking every single day. And I remember this one time, I was uh, sitting in a, uh, this, a Spaniard's room. He was like this high, high-ranking officer, and we're just doing shots of tequila. And all of a sudden, our base gets bombed. And I had no idea what was going on. You know, I'm running around, looking for my weapon, trying to... It was, it was crazy. It was total chaos, and it scared the shit out of me. So, uh, but it didn't scare me enough not to drink the rest of the time I was there. So, uh, so I, I made it out of there. I get home and, um, you know, now I'm a, I'm a combat veteran. I just, I feel like I can do whatever I want and, uh, I'm drinking every day. I, uh, I got a brand new car and of course I would always be the one that had to drive. Every time, always. Like, I just, I, I wanted to. I loved it. And um, maybe, like, two weeks after we got back, I'm, uh, I'm walking out of this bar with a beer in my hand. I, I, you know, I'm just drinking it. I set it on top of my car to get in, and I forget and drive away. And I get pulled over, like, in the parking lot. The cop watched the whole thing and asked me if I had been drinking. And I said, no. You know, of course I have not been drinking. That'd be so irresponsible. And he grabbed the beer and he handed it to me. And, you know, so I, uh, I got arrested and I got charged with a DWI. So uh, that was in North Carolina. And um, a lot of soldiers, it happens to a lot of soldiers that get DWIs. And this, a few of my buddies uh, gave me a number to this guy. He said, this is the best lawyer. You know, I paid like 10 grand or something. And he got me off of it. I was, I just completely gone like it never happened. And that even fueled it more, you know, like I felt like I was invincible. You know, I, I drank, I drove, I did whatever I wanted. I didn't care about anything but myself and getting drunk. So, um, you know, a couple of years goes by, I, I get in minimal trouble, but you know, I'm just like miserable. I'm, I'm drinking every day. I'm hungover every day. And, uh, so it's, uh, my five years is up and I'm being processed out of the military. So within that week, I, uh, I got another DWI driving through a Burger King parking lot that was in the same parking lot where I lived. Like it, it was just, you couldn't, you couldn't walk. So I drove and I was really drunk. So that one was on base and they arrested me again, but <clears throat> By the time my court date was to come up, I had already been processed out of the military. So it was like it never happened. So here I am. I'm only 20 years old, and I uh, I have no DWIs. I you know I was charged with two of them. I just feel I honestly feel like no one can touch me. You know. So I come back to Buffalo, 
and um you know like i got pulled over so many times drunk and i just flashed my veterans card and these cops just either give me a ride home or let me go you know and it's so dangerous because i didn't care how drunk i was you know like i just felt like nothing could happen to me so um a few years later i uh oh and i'm uh I'm working two jobs now. I'm home. I'm moving furniture all day long. I'm going to UPS at night. I'm working till like midnight. And then I'm going out and getting drunk and doing drugs, whatever. And I'm, you know, I have two jobs and I cannot afford to move out of my parents' basement because I am spending everything that I own or everything that I have on booze and drugs. Like I would get paid on a Thursday, Friday morning. I would wake up and there would be like four crumpled dollars in my pocket. So, um, so I'm just like kind of miserable, you know, I just, I couldn't, I didn't like it. I didn't want to keep living like that, but I didn't know how to change. You know, I didn't want to stop drinking, but I didn't want to live like that. So, uh, one of my buddies, he was traveling the country with Disney on ice and he was the manager. And he uh, says, why don't you come out on the road, man? It's great. We travel with figure skaters. You know, we're in a new city every week. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. You know, let's <laughs> let's do that. So I did. I, uh, I traveled the country for a couple of years. I was in a new city every week. And I don't remember one of these cities. Nothing. I don't remember being anywhere because all I seen was the inside of bars. You know, that's it. It's like one of my biggest regrets in life. I was in every single state. And I don't remember a thing about any of them. So, um, you know, I, uh, my whole life, I, I didn't really have a girlfriend until I was 25 because I didn't want one. You know, I, uh, I would tell girls whatever they wanted to hear, say anything, do anything just to get what I wanted. And, you know, I hurt so many girls. I was, I was awful and I never felt bad about it. My wife doesn't know this side of me, so please keep your mouth shut. Uh, <laughs> but um, so right at the end of my Disney on Ice, I, uh, I, I meet a girl, a figure skater, and I fall in love with her. We get engaged. And um, uh, like a year later, I found out that she's cheating on me, you know, and I, I'm thinking, like, how could she possibly do this to me? And, you know, my whole life, I just did that to every single other girl that was in my life. But, you know, how could somebody possibly do this to me? You know, it was, it was awful. So uh, I, I just, I quit. I couldn't be there anymore. I, I moved back to Buffalo. And, you know, this is uh, kind of when things got really out of hand for me. Um, I started using drugs pretty heavily. I, uh, like a month after being home, I was driving uh, in West Seneca. I was leaving a bar. I don't even remember being at this bar, but I fell asleep and I must have put my foot on the gas and I drove. They said I was doing about 80 and I crashed into a tree and my whole engine was next to me in the car and I didn't have a scratch on me. It was insane. The only thing I had the seatbelt burn across my chest. But, um, you know, that scared me for about two nights and that was, you know, then I didn't care anymore. You know, I just, I thought, it, you know, nothing can happen to me. So it was about this time I, uh, I meet my daughter's mother and uh, things were great for a while. You know, it was, uh, it was going very smoothly and uh, we, uh, we ended up getting pregnant. And um, this is like, I, I don't know if I panicked or what, but I just, started drinking and using drugs so much more and it was so out of control so she's getting pretty sick of it for a while we actually have the baby and um within like six months she told me that i have to get out and i couldn't believe she would do that to me how could she take my daughter away from me you know uh and i really just thought she was a total bitch for a long time you know Honestly, until I, I did the stops and I could see my part, I just thought she was a horrible person. You know, I, how could I not see like my part in this? How, like we're delusional. You know, I, I couldn't see what I was doing to anyone else besides myself. All I could see was what people were doing to me. And it, it's uh, 
you know, looking back on it, it's nuts, man. It's nuts that I actually thought that way and believed it. But, uh, but I did. So, you know, I'm, uh, I bounce around from apartment to apartment, back to my parents, whatever for, for years. And, um, my daughter's about five right now and I'm just, I'm out of control. And my parents, you know, they say, you have got to go to rehab. You have to go get help. This is, it's not okay. So, so I agreed. I went and I, I remember being in that rehab and just that feeling in my heart of believing, you know, this is it. I am not going to drink again. I'm not going to, well, that's not true. I believed I wasn't going to use drugs again because that was my problem. It wasn't drinking. I convinced myself that drinking was not my problem, but I was never going to use drugs again. And I was not going to hurt my daughter. I was not going to hurt my family. So I get out and I immediately start drinking because that's not my problem. And, you know, within two weeks, I'm full blown back to exactly where I was. And, uh, this, that kind of went on for a few years. You know, I would, uh, I would get real bad every, like I would go to rehab and I would believe that that was it. And I would try something else, you know, like, but I continued to try what I thought was going to work over and over again. I think I went to 10 detox rehabs and believed in my heart that I was never going to do it again. I wasn't going to keep putting people I love through this. And I kept failing over and over and over again. So, um, so, you know, I'm just so miserable at this point. You know, I don't know what to do. I don't want to keep living the way that I am, but I've tried everything. You know, I tried everything that I thought would possibly work and I just kept failing. So, um, my parents, my daughter's mother wouldn't even let me see my daughter at this point. For a while I could get, a have visitation, but I would have to be at my parents' house, be supervised. And I couldn't even see my daughter for years. So I, uh, I get into this pretty unhealthy relationship and, uh, I get another DWI and, um, the judge said either you do veterans court or you're going to have a felony DWI. And veterans court is basically drug court. So, so I agreed and I went for a while. I, I did what they told me to do, which, you know, you're not allowed to drink. You're not allowed to do, do drugs. So I, that lasted a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, then I figured out that my, I get tested on Wednesday so I can drink up until Monday and then uh, it'll be out of my system. And, uh, you know, so I did that for a few weeks and then I just, said, I can't, I'm not doing this. I'm just not going to go, you know, because I needed to drink those other two days. Also, I couldn't just go five days a week and drink. I needed, I needed to drink every day. So I stopped going and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just in this very unhealthy relationship and just fighting constantly. And one, uh, we got into this blowout fight, the neighbors downstairs called the police on us. And, um, I get arrested. I have a, I have a warrant out for my arrest because I stopped showing up to drug court. So I spent about a month in jail and they would not let me go until I agreed to go to a rehab. The judge, it was uh, judge Russell. And he said, you know, you're, you'll stay in here until you go. I don't care how long you're in here. You're not getting out until you go to rehab. So I agreed. And, uh, Every other time I'd been to a rehab or a detox, it was through the VA. And you can literally go to a meeting and then leave the VA and go to your apartment. You can do whatever you want. It's not like like one of these rehabs where like you're locked in there. You know, I was allowed to smoke, dip. I did whatever I wanted in this rehab. And I just thought that that's what it was all about, you know. And I uh, this time I had to go to Stutzman and... <laughs> it was a rude awakening, you know, it was, it was much different. And this was the first time that, uh, an AA group was brought into the meeting and, uh, they brought in a, they brought in a, a speaker meeting 
And the speaker said, if you want to get sober, you need to go to a meeting the day you get out. And I just, you know, I was so defeated, so willing to do whatever it took that I, I went and got that man's number. And uh, I called him the day that I got out. And he picked me up and brought me to a meeting. And then uh, at that meeting, I seen some other guy I knew I used to party with all the time. And I remember thinking, if this dude can be sober, I can do it. <laughs> so uh, so he uh, he agreed to take me to a meeting the next day. And we're uh, walking up to the South Buffalo group. And he walks me right up to this guy. And he's like, Joe, this is going to be your sponsor. And I was like, what? You know, I didn't say anything. But like on the inside, I was like, how dare this guy? You know, I want to get a sponsor. But... I want to pick who's going to sponsor me, you know, not him. But, uh, you know, I, I went along with it. And this man took me after the meeting for a walk around the block. And he said, are you willing to do whatever it takes to stay sober? And I, for some reason, I could not lie to him. Like, I just, I couldn't. And I said, I don't know, but I'm going to try. So, you know, we went from there. And the first thing he told me to do was start praying. Start asking God for help. And I, in my whole life, had never had a relationship with God. The only time that I had ever prayed was when I was pulled over and I would ask God to please help me get out of this or please help me pass this drug test. The only time I had ever prayed in my life. And I honestly did not believe that that was going to help me. I really, really did not believe that prayer was going to help me. I wanted him to tell me, you know, do X, Y, Z, and then you'll stay sober. But he just told me you got to pray. And I, I just, I, I, I thought it was crap, honestly. But I seen that he was sober and, you know, I really wanted what this man had. So my honest thinking was, this is going to take 30 seconds of my day in the morning, 30 seconds at night. You know, why not just try it? Just do it. So I did that. You know, I started praying every single day. And things started getting better in my life. You know, and I would go to my sponsor and I would tell him what happened that day and, and how things are getting better and how great I'm doing. And he was very quick to point out that it's not me. You know, these things are <clears throat> happening in spite of me, not, be, you know, not because of me. That God is working in my life. And it's, it took me a very long time to see that. You know, I just I really believe that th these amazing things in my life are happening because because I'm doing good. So, uh my my sponsor started out at the Buffalo Group, and he converted. Uh, he was in he was he was a member of uh, South Buffalo for a few years, but he uh, he was very hardcore about AA. He went to meetings every single day. He uh, he was working the steps, and he would literally. I didn't drive at this point because my what it was seventeen DWIs I got already. I don't know what it was, but, uh, so we would go to a meeting literally every single day. And after doing that for a few months, he, uh, he would make me go up or he was suggested to me that I start going up to people and introducing myself and make a commitment to go to a meeting the next day and ask for rides. And I could not have hated that anymore. You know, I, uh, I was so uncomfortable and I did not want to do it, but I did. You know, and honestly, some of those people that I asked for rides are my best friends today. So we're, uh, you know, we're going to meetings every day. And every day I'm hearing people talk about working the steps. So, you know, it's probably three or four months in by now. And I, uh, I just went up to him one day and I asked him, are we going to work the steps? He said to me, he said, have you been praying every day? Have you been going to meetings every day? He said, you're, you're working the steps. And, uh, you know, we'll get into it as soon as, uh, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he basically said it's on God's time, not mine. So, you know, shortly after that, we, uh, we started reading the book and going through the steps. And uh, I, uh, I asked him to read the third step prayer today because the third step, I had the most powerful experience of my life. I had a spiritual experience. Um, my sponsor took me to the Basilica and I don't know if you guys have ever been there, but it is just a beautiful, powerful place. And we go up there and, um, I know it's not called a stage, but we were up on the platform 
And we're, uh, we read the third step prayer, and my sponsor says, you know, just sit here for a minute, say some prayers, <clears throat> have some time with God, and, uh, you know, he's like, I'll be right over there. So I did. I, um, I, I just sat there, and I prayed, and I had this vision of, sorry, of my best friend who passed away a few years ago just clear as day, right, right there. And I could see him and I, I felt God in my life. So, uh, <clears throat> my friend passed away in Yellowstone. And, uh, <clears throat> as soon as, as soon as we were done, I, I was like, just, I broke down into tears. It was, it was so powerful. I, I literally didn't believe that God was going to help me. And at that moment I felt God helping me. So we, uh, we leave there, we go to a meeting, and it's a speaker. And the speaker shares about getting sober in Yellowstone National Park. It was, it was crazy. I, again, bawling, you know, I, I just, I, I felt God working in my life, and it was so powerful. So uh, we, uh, we continue working the steps, and uh, we're on to the fourth step. And I had... The longest list. It was there was so many people. My sex inventory was crazy, and uh, you know, I uh, I didn't realize my part in things until you know until I started putting it on paper. You know, it's uh all these resentments I have at people who harmed me, and you know, it turns out I'm the one who harmed everyone else. You know, people may have reacted to me, but you know, it was all because of me. Everything that happened and everything, everything changed, you know, after that. And, uh, so I get my list on me and my sponsor are going to go through it. And there's just this one thing that I am just so disgusted with myself about. So embarrassed, you know, I, uh, I couldn't write it on the paper. I just, I could not get myself to write this on my paper. But for a few weeks before we took my fifth stop, my sponsor told me to start saying uh, prayers and asking God for the strength to to put down whatever needs to be put down. And I did. I, did. I said that prayer every single day. And I wanted to write this thing down, but I just couldn't. I couldn't put it on paper. And, uh, you know, I'm fighting, having this internal struggle the whole time we're going through this list. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't say it to him. I couldn't take my, get myself to say this. I was just so embarrassed. And, uh, at the end of it, I didn't tell him. And he just says to me, is there anything else you need to tell me? And it like just vomited out of my mouth. I, I wasn't planning on telling him. I really had no intention of ever telling anybody. And, Immediately, it was like this weight lifted off of me. You know, I felt lighter walking out of there. I, uh, you know, you don't realize that, like, all these things you're holding in, how much they weigh you down and how much they uh, they affect you on a daily basis, you know, because you're not thinking about it every day. But those things, you know, the, the deepest, darkest secrets are the ones that need to be out the most, you know, because those are the ones that affect you the most. And then my sponsor told me a story of him basically doing the exact same thing. You know, I, I thought no one would do, did the stuff that I did. And I immediately related to him and I, I just trusted him and I couldn't wait to continue the steps. So uh, we're on to six and seven and everything in my life had been working so wonderfully and smoothly since I had, you know, brought God into my life and, you know, this uh this one is where you ask your ask for your character defects to be removed and I swear to you I uh, we we took 6 and 7 and I honestly thought that all of my character defects were going to be gone because things were working so well like everything was so smoothly and I remember honestly like the next day me and my dad got into this argument and I'm like what the hell I'm not supposed to act like this anymore. My character defects are supposed to be removed. I really believe that. I'm not even kidding. And I talked to my sponsor about it, and he's just like, you know, you're not perfect. 
this is a daily thing. You know, you're still gonna, you know, you're still gonna do the wrong thing once in a while. You're, you know, you're not perfect. It's, uh, it's about progress, man. You got to recognize those things that you're not doing right and then work on them and, you know, try not to, you know, keep making the same mistakes. So, uh, it was about this time when I met a girl in AA and, uh, I told my sponsor and he said, you know, you've been through your sex inventory, you know you know, all the mistakes you made, it's, it's up to you if you want to start dating, but you know, you just have to know your sobriety has to come first. And, you know, I, and I agreed and I started seeing this girl and, um, almost immediately it didn't feel right. You know, she started showing up to the groups that I would go to and I never seen her before. She would sit next to me. She started like texting me during the meetings and it was just like throwing me off and I just felt very uncomfortable. So I talked to my sponsor and he, you know, he said, your sobriety has to come first. So he's like, I'm not telling you what to do, but you know, you know, your sobriety has to come first. So, you know, I, uh, I had to talk to her and tell her like, I, I, I'm early in sobriety. I can't let this affect my, you know, sobriety. I, I can't do this anymore. So, uh, then I, you know, I talked to my sponsor and he said, why don't we wait until you're done with this steps and then you could start dating. So it was like a big weight lifted off of me because I, you know, I'm nervous. I don't know how to act. I don't know how to treat people yet. I, I can barely have a conversation with somebody, you know. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we take, uh, you know, step eight and nine. I, uh, I make this list of all the people I've harmed. And, you know, I got to make amends to these people. So there was a. Uh, my very first amends, oh, actually what happened was I, uh, right about this time I was working at General Motors and, um, being laid off. So, you know, and there's no way, there's no guarantee they're going to call me back. You know, I, I've just, I just don't have a job. Like it was like so quick. It was like a week. They tell you, right, you're being laid off on Friday. Excuse me. So I am so full of fear and anxiety. I'm just so nervous. I don't know what I'm going to do. And, um, you know, I'm talking to my sponsor about it and he said, you need to just get into the steps, man, start, start doing something like you worrying and having all this anxiety is not helping you. What will help you is if you start working the steps and start making these amends. So I, I agreed, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, well, this isn't going to help me get a job, but you know, it, it'll take my mind off of it. I'll do it. So my first amends was to, uh, one of my very closest friends, he, um, you know, he was just such a great friend. He actually like moved me into his house at one point and like kind of ran like a halfway house. You know, he gave me a curfew. He would give me drug tests. And, uh, you know, he told me if I drank or used again, he never wanted to talk to me ever again. And that's exactly what I did. I, uh, I used drugs again. He kicked me out of the house. Uh, he told me don't ever contact me again. So it was years. I never talked to him. He was one of my closest friends. So, uh, we, we have a lot of mutual friends though. So I, he, I guess he was just, you know, checking up to see how I was doing through other people. And I reached out to him to make an amends and he agreed. We met and, uh, you know, I told him all the things that I needed to say. I asked him if there's anything he needed to say, you know, he was just so happy that, I was, you know, cleaning myself up that he didn't want anything back for what I did to him. And in the, in the four or five years that I hadn't spoken to him, he had started this major company. It was a huge company. And he asked me if I wanted a job right on the spot, you know? So like, I am just so full of fear and anxiety about working. And then I just get involved in the steps and, you know, things just drop in my lap. It's nuts. So I, I agreed, you know, I took the job and I worked there for a while and, uh, there was, there was another, another one of, uh, my amends that I was terrified to make so scared. I, uh, I worked at a mattress company for a while. So, um, you know, I, I, I stole a bunch of mattresses and I sold them and, you know, I just, I needed extra money. Well, what am I going to do? So, 
So I was just terrified. I, I'm thinking I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to owe this guy like five thousand dollars. Like I, I just I couldn't get myself to do it, and I, uh, you know, I just kept talking about it, kept talking to people, and they, you know, they just told me you got to just do it, man. It'll work out exactly the way God wants it to work out. So, so I I called him. I sat down with him, and I told him exactly what I did, and he looked me right in the face. He says, "I know you stole those mattresses." You know, and I'm like, well, what, what can I do to make it right? He's like, the fact that you cared enough to reach out to me after all of this time is all I need. You know, he was just happy to see that I was doing good and, you know, on the right path. Like, that's how it turned out for me. Like, everybody was just didn't want anything from me. They just wanted me to do the right thing. And uh, it's it's just crazy to me. How, you know, when you do the right thing and you have God in your life, how things just work out. I just, it's like, it's just miracles happen all the time. So, um, we're on to 10, 11, and 12, you know, and uh, these are the steps that I have to live in every single day. You know, I, I don't believe that I'm ever through the steps, you know, I've taken the steps, but I have to practice these principles in all of my affairs every day. You know, I have to take take an inventory and work on not making the same mistakes. And I have to make things right, you know, because just because I've been through the steps doesn't mean I'm perfect like I thought I was on 6 and 7. But, uh, you know, I, I have to make those things right. I can't just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. I have to I have to make progress. You know, I want to be a better person. I don't want to keep, you know, making the same mistakes and living in old behaviors because I just, you know, I'm so blessed that the life I have today and I don't want to lose it. So, you know, the only, a wise man once told me, um, if you're not improving, you're coasting. And the only way to coast is downhill. So that always stuck with me, you know, like I can't just coast along because I'm just I'm either going up or I'm going down. You know, I can't just sit still. So, uh, hmm. so then I, uh, I, I started sponsoring guys and I didn't think I was ready. You know, I was so nervous, but my sponsor told me to start praying and asking for somebody to be placed in my life. And I did that. And, and within like two weeks, somebody asked me to be their sponsor. And I could not have been more nervous. You know, I uh, I just didn't want to let him down. I didn't want to say the wrong thing. I was calling my sponsor every single time we had a conversation and asking him if what I said was okay. Could I have said something better? And he just, you know, told me to calm down, man. He said, God is speaking through me. You know, as long as I'm saying prayers and asking for God's help and doing what I think is right and telling him what I think is right, then, like, I can't make any mistakes. You know, it's because it's not me talking, it's God. So, uh, those have been some of the most powerful moments of my life, is just watching another man grow in sobriety, grow in their lives, and uh, <clears throat> change their lives, you know, because it's just, it's so much different watching somebody else than, you know, like, I can't see myself getting better, but I I can watch another man get better. And it's, uh, you know, and it's not because of me, but, you know, like God placed them in my life and I'm doing my best to help those people. And it's, there's nothing like it. You know, I always, I always get selfish and I, I think I want all this stuff and it never makes me happy. You know, what makes me happy is helping other people. It it really does. I, uh, I have a, a few stories um, I'll tell you one right now. It just happened a few days ago. My wife had uh, has these friends who they moved to Buffalo from Poughkeepsie, and the girl is uh, she's a teacher, and she decided that she was taking the summer off. She wasn't going to work, so um, they needed to be moved. Uh, this week. So my wife said, can you please give him a discount? I'm like, yeah, I'll give him a little discount, but uh, you know, I'm not going to do the job for free. And I'm like, she's like, well, they're not doing well with money. I'm like, well, she chose not to work. Like, why is that my problem? 
You know, like she could have went to work this summer. She chose not to. So I'm like getting like worked up about it. Honestly, like it's starting to piss me off. So, <laughs> so the day of the move, uh, my, my wife's friend calls her and says that they have to sell one of their cars because they can't afford to fix it. And my wife says, Joe, you really have to help that. And I'm like, no, I don't. You know, like I said, she could have worked. Like, why is this all of a sudden my problem? Because she chose to take the summer off. And I am just, I'm like getting even more worked up. And my wife just says to me, she says, go say some prayers. You know, like, what is your problem? So I did. I'm like, sure, I'll say some prayers, but I'm not doing it for free. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did. And I, uh, I went and I said some prayers. I'm driving there. I'm saying prayers the whole time. And... I don't know what, what happened. I just, at the end, I, the whole time, like I said, I wasn't going to give them a deal. And I just said, just give me enough money to pay my guy at the end. So she gave me 60 bucks, whatever, to pay my guy. And, um, you know, I'm just, I, of course, I felt good about it. But as I'm leaving, pulling out, this random truck just pulls up in front of my truck and, like, blocks me in. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? I got to get out of here. And he runs out, and on the side of my moving truck, it says veteran-owned and operated. And he just runs up, and he hands me $40. And he says, I just want to buy you guys lunch. You know, that, that is nuts, man. You know, like, I'm just, when I do the right thing, good things just happen. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. That paid for all my gas for the day, you know. I didn't make any money, but, you know, I, uh, I felt good about it. And... You know, it's just it's just crazy how how these miracles happen and how things just work out when we do the right thing. So, uh, you know, um, so I've been through the stops at this point, and um, I have a crush on this girl. She's from the North Buffalo group. I go there every week because I want to check her out. <laughs> <laughs> and my. Uh, my sponsor says, if you feel ready, man, you go for it. So so I went and I introduced myself, and we went on a few dates, and uh, she's my wife today. And we have a very healthy relationship. We're honest with each other. We She is quick to call me out when I'm not doing the right thing or when I'm being an asshole, which is can be pretty often. You know, I uh, I don't mean to be. I, tr I try to to be the best husband I can be, but, you know, sometimes I get caught up in the moment, I get angry, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm doing my best to be better. You know, I, uh, I ask for God's help every single day. And then I do my best to do my part and to not make the same mistakes, to continue to try to grow in this program and, you know, continue to stay, continue to try to stay close to God. Because that's what this is all about, you know. It's uh, it's not about me. It's not about any one of you. It's about God and growing closer with God. That is what this program is about. You know, I've been through periods of my sobriety where, you know, I was working overnights or whatever the case may be where I couldn't make it to as many meetings. And there was never a day in my sobriety where I didn't get on my knees and ask God for help. Because that is what this program is all about. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, when I go a long period of time without going to meetings, I start to, I can feel it. I, uh, I get anxious and I, I get restless. And, and I can tell when I need a meeting, you know. And, and now, if I can't tell, my wife is quick to tell me that I need to go to a meeting. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like, th th that anger starts coming back. And, and you know, it's just... It's, uh, I, I really honestly try to do the right thing always, but the further I get away from meetings, the harder it is to do that. You know, I don't know why that is because I know it's right. And I know that I, uh, I can't get, I shouldn't get angry and I shouldn't overreact, but the, the, the further away from meetings I get, it, it gets tougher to do those things that I have to do on a, on a regular basis, you know? I've been through the steps. I, uh, For me, that's what is the most important part of my day is doing the right thing. 
Like I pray very hard for God to give me the strength to do the right thing because, you know, that's uh, that's kind of what was what was beaten into me in early sobriety is very important. I remember I uh, I just started this job. I was working at GM, and everyone would wash their hands. They had like uh, crews that would come in and clean up after us, and everyone would wash their hands and throw their paper towel in the corner and miss. And there would be paper towels everywhere. And I, I remember I did that once, and I missed. And I walked out, and I'm just like, that's not the right thing to do. So I went, and I got my paper towel around 250 balls on the ground, and I put it in the garbage. And I felt better about myself. Because it's those small things, you know? The small things lead into bigger things, you know? like It's like a snowball. You know, when you, uh, the more you do the right thing, even no matter how little and insignificant it is, those lead to bigger things. They lead to doing the right thing in every situation. And that's uh, that's what I try to do today. So um, a few years ago, one of my closest friends, um, <clears throat> he was in and out for a while. His name was Mike. And, uh, you know, he came back in and he was just something was different, you know, like he wanted it and he was trying so hard and he was doing the right thing. He was working the steps. He had a sponsor. This is his big book. And, uh, we started a company together. We started the moving company that I own. We owned it together and we, uh, we worked hard. We built it from the ground up and, you know, it was just me and him. And we, uh, would go out and do jobs 15 hours sometimes, you know, we did it on our own. And, you know, after about a year of having the company, I just noticed that he's not going to meetings anymore, you know, and, and, you know, he's getting angry and pissed and I, I could see it. Like he wasn't happy. And I would talk to him every day and I was like, well, you know, you want to go to a meeting? And he just refused. He's like, no, I, I don't want to go to meetings anymore. Like as long as I don't do heroin, I'll be fine. That's literally what he said to me. So, you know, that lasts for a few months and, you know, I could just tell things were getting worse and worse. Uh, he still wasn't using, but he was, he was not happy. He was very discontent and irritable. And I got a call from his mother one day and she told me that, uh, he was in the hospital. He, he relapsed and, uh, overdosed and he ended up in the hospital. So, um, he was in there for a few days. I went and I, uh, I met him afterwards. We had this long, heartfelt talk. He promised me it wasn't going to happen again. He was so sorry that he let me down. And, uh, you know, he, he just said he wanted to come back to AA and he wanted to, to start doing the thing because he was, so, he, he admitted how unhappy he was and just how things were not going right. So we, uh, we made a plan. We went to uh, OP Step, and we we met up with a few guys first. We met up with my sponsor and his old sponsor, and we got some pizza, and we just sat around and talked, and it was such a great talk. He, I'll never forget, at the end of it, he just gave me a big hug, and he said, you know, thank you so much. I love you. This Things are going to be different this time. So we went to OP Step. And, um, you know, I, I remember seeing him at the end of the meeting. He stuck around and, and got a job and joined the home group. And then, um, you know, the next day I, uh, you know, I waved to him. I left. And the next day I'm texting him all day. He's not answering, you know. So his mom calls me and she says, I can't get a hold of Mike. He was supposed to come over for lunch and he never showed up. So, you know, I just figured he, you know, he went out and he's out with his friends doing whatever. And I'm just, something doesn't feel right. I'm laying in bed and my wife says, you should go over there. So I go over there. All his lights are on. I'm banging on his door. It's locked. And I called his mom and she said, break that door down, you know, so she comes over and I, you know, I broke into the house and he was lying there face dead in a pool of blood. He had, uh,
uh, he had overdosed. He, uh, you know, apparently had to get one last in, and it was it was the last one. So, you know, I'm real real resentful. You know, now like, what am I supposed to do? How how like immediately it, it turns to how could he do this to me? You know. So I had to do a lot of praying, a lot of talking to guys about it because, you know, it's not about me as much as it feels like it is. It's not. So, so I had a few friends who, uh, you know, I had jobs booked for months and I had a few friends who helped me out here and there, but I had to hire somebody. And, uh, so I put out an ad on Craigslist and I hire this guy and he, he does great, but he, uh, he is taking like a, almost a three month vacation in the middle of summer, which is our busiest time. So, you know, so I, I don't, I was going back in my head. Do I book jobs? Do I not? It's like, what am I going to do? And then, uh, so this, this other friend from AA, she's like, I have, my nephew needs a job. You want to hire him? And, uh. It's like, sure. So I booked a bunch of jobs. I had to talk with this kid and I'm like, I explained to him, I'm like, it's just me and you, you know, like, do you want to do this? Because I, I will not be able to do it without you. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm in, I'll do it. And, uh, we work one day and this kid is like, this is too hard. I don't want to do this ever again. <laughs> so I'm just like, what the heck? Like I didn't have, I had no backup plan, nothing. I didn't know what I was going to do. So. Um, so I had to give one of my sponsees, uh, a coin at the South Buffalo group that night. So I went there and, uh, I gave him his coin and I'm just sitting there, you know, thinking about myself, like, what am I going to do? I have jobs booked for the next month. I have no one to help me. I don't like, I can't do this by myself. So then all of a sudden this guy over here, Nate shares in the middle of the meeting and he says, I really need a job. If anybody could please help me. <laughs> I, I'm not even kidding. Like, it, it was nuts. Like, I'm just sitting here thinking, what am I going to do? And this guy says, I need a job. So I went and talked to him after the meeting, and uh, he's been with me ever since, you know. God places people in your lives at exactly when you need them, you know. This, uh, this program has absolutely saved my life. It's crazy. I, I get so emotional because... You know, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of joy, just a lot of emotions. You know, this, uh, from where I came from to where I am today is, is pretty insane. You know, I, I honestly feel like today I have everything that I've ever wanted in my life. Like, you know, I, I have the company, I have the, the wife, I have the car, the house. But all of those things will go away so fast if I do not continue to do this on a regular basis, you know, I can't just do something for my sobriety once a week and think, you know, I'm going to be good. It doesn't work like that. You know, it is, it has been proven to me so many times that this is a very delicate thing. This is life or death, you know, and I have to act like my life depends on it because it does, you know, my life depends on doing this thing on a daily basis and helping other people as much as I don't want to sometimes, you know, I, I have to not because, because they need the help because I need the help. You know, when I help somebody else, it helps me way more than it helps them. So, uh, you know, this program is one day at a time and, uh, you know, there's no day more important than today. You know, I, uh, I don't have to be perfect tomorrow. I don't have to, it doesn't matter what I did yesterday. All that matters to me is today. And today I woke up and I asked God for help. I did my very best to go around and do the right thing and to help people. And, uh, you know, and today's a great day and I'm blessed. So that's all I got. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.